A call to improve the UN's peacekeeping missions. They are overstretched, undermanned, and plagued by scandals. So what is the state of peace operations? Are they in trouble? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. More than 100,000 UN peacekeepers serving in 16 missions on four continents. Their goal is to protect civilians, maintain peace and security. But their operations have not been without controversy, including allegations of sexual abuse. Demand for peacekeepers in conflict zones it continues to rise, but the UN is struggling to keep up. Twelve months after world leaders pledged to strengthen and modernize peacekeeping operations, the U.K. is hosting a follow-up to see where things stand. Defense ministers from more than 70 countries have met in London, as Sonia Gallego reports. Numerous abuse scandals that have implicated the UN's peacekeeping force has been the motivation for the summit in London. The purpose to invest in measures preventing the abuse of residents in countries that have peacekeeping operations. Atul Khare, the UN Under Secretary General for Field Support, said that the UN simply could not afford more lapses in peacekeeping conduct. Now, defence ministers from 80 countries are attending, including the US Defence Secretary Ash Carter. There are a broad a number of countries that are willing to deploy peacekeepers. 25 additional ones have announced military and police contributions amounting to more than 12,000 uniformed personnel. One particular goal is about how those contributing countries can make sure that peacekeepers can deploy quickly, ideally within 30 to 90 days rather than a year after a conflict ends. At the start of the summit, the UK's defence minister, Michael Fallon, said that sexual exploitation by UN peacekeepers had to be eliminated and that the UN needs to improve planning for peacekeeping, get more troop contributions and improve their performance. Fallon also cited the shocking examples of poor performance by peacekeepers. He didn't give details but said he was referring to cases of sexual abuse and exploitation by some peacekeeping troops. The Uruguayan delegation has made a point about how they have held errant troops accountable for sexual crimes while they were deployed. And on the subject of bringing sexual abuse by peacekeepers to an end, Ash Carter said that the Pentagon was ready to help. The UN says the need for peacekeepers is greater than ever. It currently has 16 peacekeeping operations on four continents. More than 118,000 people are deployed. Now, their job is to provide security and support to countries making the transition from conflict to peace. The UN does not have its own military force, so it depends on member states, no matter how large or small, rich or poor. At least 121 countries currently contribute peacekeepers. Ethiopia provides the largest number, 8,000, followed by India and Pakistan, which each contribute more than 7,000. The United Kingdom comes in at 52 with 336 peacekeepers, while the United States ranks 73rd, contributing just 68 peacekeepers. But the U.S. is the leading financial contributor to peacekeeping operations, and the U.K. is sixth. Let's bring in our guests now for this discussion in London. Rosa Friedman, professor of law and global development at the University of Reading. Anadi Sababa via Skype, Mahari Maru international consultant on African Union affairs and also in London, Jack Christophides, director of policy evaluation and training at the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Welcome to all of you. Appreciate your time very much on this discussion. So uh, more than 70 nations showed up for this summit. Mahari, what is that indicative of that there seems to be a lot of participation and the fact that there was even a need for this summit? I think um uh, there is a lot of demand now for peacekeeping uh, and peace support operation in general uh, all over the world uh, for various reasons, but the conflicts now has become highly localized, uh, intrastate, and needing uh, more resource in terms of human, financial, and political leadership. Uh, and I think there is an increase in commitment and recognition on the need to strengthen the capability of the United Nations and other regional uh, organizations to respond to these conflicts before they emerge 
and fester into a global crisis, a regional uh, and international crisis. And so there is a self-serving interest because uh, current conflicts are not, they are, even if they are highly localized, but their implication is very global. And uh, you see uh, an increasing interest. Earlier in your introduction, you mentioned, for example, Ethiopia contributes uh, uh, the largest one as we speak currently, but that number excludes actually uh, Ethiopia's contribution under the African Union mission in Somalia, AMISO. If you add that one, the number will uh, immediately increase. So there are many African countries also who are contributing to a regional uh, peacekeeping uh, uh, support uh, and peacekeeping and support, uh, peace support operations. So it shows the increasing interest, even if uh, the determination in terms of committing uh, one's resource uh, and uh, uh, peacekeepers is still questionable, but there is an increasing interest uh, because of the threat in local areas are no more limited to the local community or local areas. And they are global and they are rich. Um, Jack, uh, do, do you, are you encouraged by the fact that, that so many countries participated in this summit? We are, very much so. Uh, first of all, last year when President Obama called for the leadership uh, summit, uh, we had uh, a number of very, very important pledges uh, from across, uh, across the world, actually, uh, over 50 new pledges. Th since then, we've had almost 30 additional pledges. So as the previous speaker was saying, it's not just that demand is, is there, but for the first time in a long time, we've also got more uh, interest in supply, in, in supplying us with, with, with more troops and, frankly, better troops with better capabilities that are needed for modern peacekeeping. So very encouraged. And actually, we're going to come back to that point that you just made, Jack. But first, I want to talk to Rosa. Rosa, you were part of uh, one of these roundtable discussions yesterday. Tell me what it's like. Tell me what, what you heard. Well, obviously, it's a Chatham House uh, roundtable, so I can't tell you exactly what I heard or exactly who said things. But it is very promising to see so many people engaged, not just with the summit itself, but with the, with the events going on in the margins, with the bilateral and multilateral meetings, with civil society, with academics, with experts, not just seeing peacekeeping as something that's in-house for the UN, but recognising it's something that affects people across the world and that engages a whole range of actors outside of the peacekeeping missions themselves. Are you able to tell me what some of the priorities were that were mentioned there? <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, I think there are a number of key priorities. Some of those have already been picked up on, the need for more troops and better troops, but also the priorities around accountability and around engagement with local populations, around protection of civilians and when use of force should be used. Th those are key priorities that have been talked about for many years and increasingly talked about over the last couple of years, but it's really important that they're being talked about in a targeted summit that's away from New York and UN headquarters. Okay, um, you brought up a, a lot of great points. Jack, what is being done to to get, to fill these roles, these needs, the role, uh, the peacekeeping troops, the, you need more troops, what is being done to get these numbers up? And, and also why the increased need? Well, the increased need, unfortunately, is because in a number of places, uh, the majority of them in, in Africa, we, we clearly have some challenges that require a, a third party. And, and the Security Council, the United Nations Security Council, has felt the need to deploy not just a number of missions, but a number of large missions with very robust mandates uh, covering everything from elections to extending state authority, rule of law, and uh, as Rosa said, protecting civilians. That's our, our core business. What's different now is, I think, uh, an appreciation by more countries than ever before that this is a global enterprise. We can't just rely on troops from the South. Uh, they've done a terrific job up to now, but it's been very difficult. Many, many African uh, contributors to UN peacekeeping have not had the expeditionary capacity that we need, which allows them to deploy quickly when there's a crisis. Uh, so now we are standing up a rapid deployment force. Uh, we'll hopefully have it uh, next year. Um, but the countries that are going to be making that up are all countries that are committed to deploying their troops within two months. And that's something we have not had for a very long time. And I think it'll make a tremendous difference on the ground. Mahar, do you, do you agree with that? Yes, uh, well, I think uh, to, with some caveat. Uh, the first one is, um, as we have seen in many of these uh, missions, especially in Darfur and uh, under uh, the hybrid uh, mission of the African Union and United Nations, we know the main 
constraints, if you wish, binding constraints for African Union missions was were uh, two, basically. First, the financial capability that is required for deployment of forces, uh, and also the second one in terms of political leadership, even if you have also limitations on airlifting, on sea lift, and other kind of logistical capabilities that are required for immediate deployment, but funding and political lack of political determination, not only will, but determination, the capability to put your time, energy, uh, in terms of putting the forces on the ground. So uh, I wouldn't say it's because uh, the expeditionary capability that uh, countries have in Africa is not something that is not sufficient. It's, uh, more, it has to do more with uh, the political uh, determination uh, to turn uh, normative frameworks into impl uh, to implement them practically on the ground. Uh, and also uh, the lack of resource, uh, because most of the peacekeeping troops and peacekeeping uh, for, uh, missions require huge resource, and that is a, a big limitation on the African continent. Uh, so the expeditionary capability is not as important as it was decades ago. Increasingly, I think London conference will look at that, and I'm very hopeful, and the recent reports by UN has already looked at that, is the competence, the core competence of peace support operation has changed because the dynamics that the earlier speakers have already identified, the dynamics has changed. Uh, states are, states' legitimacy has been uh, fragmented, diminished because of their nature. State nature now in most of these uh, conflict, conflict areas are uh, basically uh, uh, contested in terms of their legitimacy and needing external forces to intervene. Uh, where states has been very strong on wrong functions, strong okay. on okay. regime protection, palace protection, and so on, not protecting human rights and human security. Okay, and Mahari, okay. if I can stop you for just a moment, we, we're going to pick up on some of what you're saying, but I also wanted to bring Rosa into this. So, Rosa, this need to, to build up troops quickly because there's a deficit, because they need more troops, or do you have any concerns about who the troops are and what the screening process is? Well, I think there, the concerns on the screening process is something that, that really needs to be addressed system-wide. Um, but there are also concerns around not just the screening of troops, who they are and what their motivations are, whether or not they have criminal records, things like this, that are the legal processes that we might expect within individual countries. But there's also the problem about pre-deployment training. Do we know that these troops understand basic human rights law, basic international humanitarian law? Do they understand the, the human rights laws around sexual violence? around what constitutes a child, that within international law and, and under the UN umbrella, any, any woman or any boy under the age of 18 constitutes a child and therefore they're not allowed to engage in sexual activity with those children. There is a real worry that the, the need to deploy troops will override the need to ensure that those troops do not cause any further harm on the ground, either on purpose or through lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, lack of training before they arrive. Um, Rosa, you brought up a lot of good points, and I, and I want Jack to respond to that. But first, I kind of want to touch on some of the things that you referenced. Um, over the years, UN peacekeepers have lost credibility in some of the countries where they're stationed. In the Democratic Republic of Congo and Central African Republic, troops have been accused of sexually abusing and exploiting people they are supposed to protect. In Haiti, UN soldiers were accused of causing a cholera outbreak six years ago. Thousands of people died from that. And in July of this year, peacekeepers in South Sudan were accused of doing nothing while government soldiers raped women near a UN compound in the capital, Juba. So, Jack, that's just a few of the controversies that have happened over the last 20 years. And Rosa brought, brought up some, some valid points. I want you to respond to that. Why is this happening? Well, I hope you're also going to reflect the fact that uh, uh, peacekeeping, which is uh, an endeavor which has been going on for many, many decades, has brought about a tremendous amount of good as well. Oh, we will. Uh, we will. Many, many. <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, yes, there have been these cases that you've mentioned, and of course each one of them is regrettable, both on an individual basis for the victims, uh, but also in terms of the dim d damage that it's done to the reputation of the United Nations. 
uh, for a number of years now, but especially more recently, we have been taking additional measures together with the countries that provide us with these troops, because at the end of the day, these are not our troops. They always belong to the countries that send them. And we've tried to come up with better ways to prevent that from happening, and if it does happen, to make sure that the troops are held accountable. And indeed also to make sure that the political leadership of those peacekeeping operations is held accountable. So let me and ask you that. Uh, let me ask you that. Is there ever a situation where it, it's difficult to hold people accountable because these countries stand up for these people that, that are doing this and threaten to pull their other troops? Does that happen? It has happened. Uh, what we're trying to do now is make sure that every country that sends troops to us understands exactly what is expected of them. Uh, where we can help, we try to help. Uh, Rosa mentioned quite rightly the training, the pre-deployment training that goes on. We, we expect armies to bring their soldiers up to a certain level of proficiency. When they come over to us uh, and they become blue helmets, we provide additional training because it's one thing to be a national army soldier, it's a different thing to be a peacekeeper. As a peacekeeper, you're expected to do certain things and to avoid other things. And when those, when those peacekeepers fall on the wrong side of that, we expect the countries to hold them accountable. It's our responsibility to bring those charges to the respective countries and make sure that those countries are actually dealing with it. Now, in the past, I'm sad to say, that has not always been the case. But I do believe, and today's meeting in London is an affirmation of that, that that, that corner is being turned. Nobody wants to be... Uh, responsible for their troops committing violations of any kind, misconduct or sexual. Rosa, it seems like you wanted to get in on this. Go right ahead. Jack, may I ask you a question on, on the accountability? We know that peacekeeping wasn't, um, wasn't thought about when the, when the UN Charter was drafted and when the Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the UN was, was agreed. The, the frameworks that we have where troop contributing countries are supposed to hold accountable their troops for, for sexual violence or for other criminal acts when abroad um, doesn't even take into account the idea that many countries don't have extraterritorial criminal laws. They aren't able to prosecute their troops when they commit crimes abroad. Is it not time for us to have a new mechanism, to have an independent mechanism, not OIOS, not something attached to the UN, but an independent mechanism that will hold accountable individuals, whether they are troops or civilians, who commit these kind of grave crimes when they are abroad under the UN umbrella? So th the question of whether it's this mechanism or that is, is an important one, no doubt. Uh, but I think the more important thing, if you allow me to say, is that there is a proper mechanism, and it may well be different in one country from another, that does hold people accountable. Now, again, I, I, I'm not trying to wish away the past, that there were some countries that didn't, either because they failed to have the right legal regime in place or they lacked the political will. Uh, now, if there is to be one international mechanism for this, it would be a decision for the member states, the troop contributing countries. I personally do not see that uh, happening in the short term. I think it's something that could be a longer term or medium term aspiration. But I think in the meantime, we've got to work with what we've got. Um, and again, accountability at the end of the day is something that happens after the event. Our greater focus has got to be on preventing violations from occurring in the very first place. And can I just say, they overwhelmingly are prevented. It is a tiny minority of peacekeepers that are causing the reputational damage that we've spent so much time talking about today. The overwhelming majority of peacekeepers are going about their job in a professional way carrying out important responsibilities relating to peace and security. That's why the membership of the United Nations year after year invests billions of dollars in peacekeeping and why even now today after the greatest financial crisis, peacekeeping is the single most expensive thing that the UN does throughout the world. The, the, the value of peacekeeping is well recognized, but we've got some black spots that we need to tackle. Let, let's talk, no doubt about it. Let's talk more about what the role of these peacekeepers are. In addition to maintain, maintaining peace and security, these UN peacekeepers also help the political process in host countries and assist with the disarmament of fighters. The UN also helps reintegrate former fighters into communities and support host countries organizing peaceful elections. They are also tasked with promoting human rights and restoring the rule of law. Um, Mahari, that is quite a list. What are some of the places you think that, that UN peacekeepers have succeeded with these responsibilities? I think um, their task is not less than 
state building or rebuilding of a nation, actually. In many aspects, almost all the components that you have mentioned or you have in peace support operations, uh, you will include almost all aspects of uh, uh, state building. And uh, that is a huge task uh, to give to an organization like United Nations or other regional organizations that strive to uh, build states in many parts of uh, uh, the troubled regions in the, in the world. Now, uh, if you wish, um, you have many, uh, the, the first question you could raise is counterfactual questions. Imagine uh, South Sudan without peace uh, support operation. And I always call the counterfactual questions so that people could have a perspective rather than looking at only the contribution in positive perspective only. So you would think of uh, Somalia without Amazon. What region would you have without Amazon for the past uh, uh, almost a decade, if you wish? So uh, the same goes to the other peace support operation uh, uh, countries where the, there is peace support operation. Now, the question is, how much were they effective in terms of effectiveness of performance and addressing the core missions? How much legitimate were they in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, the, the necessary background uh, for intervention and so on and so on? The accountability issue has to be looked upon uh, from uh, the basics. You know, These are troops coming from uh, the region, uh, from Africa or elsewhere, uh, then they will have all elements of uh, the armed forces that the countries are sending, you mm -hmm. know, the countries, uh -huh. troop contributing countries. So the elements that we see in terms of violation or performance in general will be reflected in these peace support operations. The issue of accountability, in my opinion, there is a need for accountability, but the best accountability is local accountability, regional accountability. Okay. The principle of okay. subsidiarity okay. to put... Mahari, let, let me get in for a moment and let me get in for just a moment, Mahari, and, and bring Rosa into this discussion. Rosa, is it a fair critique to say that sometimes UN troops have been used or, or may currently be being used in certain situations where the international community wants to appear to be doing something but but isn't doesn't want to do too much? What kind of situations are you thinking about? I would, perhaps you don't think that's a fair critique then. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, I think, I think that, and, and I'd echo um, Jack's point, UN peacekeepers and hybrid peacekeeping missions in some countries do the most phenomenal work. They've stopped genocides. They stopped a genocide recently in Central African Republic. We, we want and we need peacekeeping operations to continue. When I think about Haiti, I wonder why there are troops on the ground and tanks in the street in a country that is supposed to have a stabilization mission and a country where there's supposed to be help and enabling state building rather than peace building. But, there are big questions to ask as to why some peacekeeping missions have evolved in the ways that they have. And the accountability aspect is only one part of why local communities do not engage well with the peacekeeping mission in Haiti. Whereas local communities in Central African Republic who see the protection of civilian work that's been done by those peacekeepers, who really value those peacekeepers being there, who are, who are literally saving their lives, will of course have a much greater affinity with and stronger relationship with those peacekeeping operations. I don't think we can lump all in together. I think we have to think about peacekeeping, yes, holistically, but also think about the how we how we wrap up peacekeeping when it's no longer needed and how the relationships change with local populations once conflicts have been have been settled and once political processes have had that space to grow. Jack, I see you nodding and I'm gonna let you have the last word. Do you think that that's a fair critique that, that Rosa brought up? I do, I do. If you look at uh, the track record over uh, seven decades, uh, we've gone into places which have been burning, we've stayed, we've stabilized, and we've left. That's the ideal situation. Some of those experiences have been quick. Um, I'm thinking of Mozambique, in, even in my own country, South Africa. But other, other situations, like in Congo, we've been there a long time, and we've been there more than once. Uh, the, the, the problems that give rise to in these countries are not easily solved by a foreign presence, even one with all the muscle that a UN peacekeeping operation has. We've got to work much more closely with governments, with the people on the ground, to try and bring about transformative change.
but we're always going to realize the, the very great differences that exist throughout the world. In some places we welcomed and we bring about the most effective change. In other places we are not welcomed and it's hard going all the way. Thank you all for this uh, very important discussion. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you to our guests, uh, Rosa Friedman and Jack Christophides in London and Mahari Maru in Addis Ababa. And thank you all for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you visit our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now. <laughs>